Good evening, everyone. I hope everyone can hear me. If there's any issues, just let me know and I'll try to resolve them on the fly. If not, let's jump in with uh, both feet. Got a lot to get into on this, what do you call it? Spring Solstice Eve and this electoral county primary election Eve. So, uh, really happy to have you out here. Um, tomorrow's the first day of spring. Uh, one of my favorite times of the year, spring and summer. I'm a tropical dude. I don't rock too heavy with winter, but, you know, I see the necessity. I choose to live up in the uh, in the uh, more temperate regions of this, this hellhole, this shithole of the country. So I guess I got to just pay my dues. Let me turn down the mood music. I know how y'all don't like being put in the mood. Seduced by soft sounds. Please like, share, subscribe, support. You know, I be feeling like a chump sucker, scallywop, and a gump. Every time I sit down to prep shows, do my book, set up my book reviews, edit video, because I'm like, I don't feel like I get the support I deserve. But who does, really? I mean, can I, I, am I even worthy to complain that I don't get the support that I deserve? But who does? Who out there full, feels fully appreciated? Because I don't. And maybe I'm not unique in that. But, you know, please support the Brody Allo broadcast in the capacity that you deem me worthy of. That's all I can say. I'm not very good at this asking stuff, but I'm just going to leave it at that and not to get too heavy in it. Like I said, tomorrow is the spring solstice. So all of y'all out there that it's like, if you got some ethereal, mystical, spiritual brother or sister you crushing on, tomorrow's the day to step to them. Because I mean, spring, the, the first day of spring, the spring equinox, for like ethereal hippie, you know, cro crocheted pants and head wrap, copper and crystal incense folks, yoga folks, that's that's like their New Year's Eve, Christmas and and Thanksgiving and Juneteenth all wrap into one. So go on if you've been crushing on some ethereal weirdo, if you if you know somebody copper crystal shrine type brother or sister that you've been crushing on, I'm telling you, and you let tomorrow go without saying something to them, you missed an opportunity. Go on and be like, brother, brother, I think we are in balance. And go, dudes, go, hey, my sister, this is a time of renewal. It is time for our love to balance. I'm just saying, run that hustle on them. So go to your mystical, spiritual homie. Go to your mystical, spiritual friend and, and say some words to them. Don't let the spring equinox come and go because then for the rest of the year, they're going to be like, uh, they energy is is off, you know. The brothers out of you know the brothers radiating some some weird energy. They gonna say shit about you. So you better acknowledge this day. Do something. Just give somebody a dandelion. Don't even buy a flower. You know, do something. I'm just saying. Haven't been around them folks. This is they tomorrow's they day. Tomorrow is they day, and especially if you're trying to hook up with 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 some mystical patchouli, you know, scented oil type incense burner if, if, if that, tomorrow's your day just say something anything they'll be like you know this is the season of renewal and do you come into my life at the right moment i'm telling you i'm telling you more than valentine's day more than any other holiday i'm telling you but that's only only if you're trying to hook up with a mystical spiritual truth serum uh ethereal person 
Now, if if you if you trying to hook up with a Muslim or a Christian, you come talk that stuff, they're gonna call down rain down hellfire on you. Paganism. So it only works. That it only works. I promise you, you won't fail. I promise you. Name your first grandchild after me, because I will be. If it's like, yo, bro, Dia, yeah, I was looking at this sister, you know, with long locks, and she had like crystals and copper wrapped up in her locks, and she was always zigzagging up and down the sidewalk, singing a song to herself, you know. And I was just something about her. And then Bro Diallo told me, yo, on March nineteenth, go say something. If I never had the courage to say something, or if I said something in the past, and she told me, you know. She 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 burned some sage and she took a sage wand and 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 and, and smoke and then disappeared like Batman, like a ninja with smoke. So if you've been sage wand and I'm telling you, if you step to them tomorrow, every mystical person is waiting for something to demonstrate the new beginning, the rebirth, the renewal. I'm just saying. And if I was a scammer, if I was a hustler. If I was a charlatan, I'd be using this myself, but I'm too principled. I'm too principled to use that. So I ain't going to say nothing about the equinox, but for y'all who ain't as ethical as me, who know how to push buttons. So, you know, and I've been hearing a lot of people talking to me about this, this jibber jabber that uh, Jared, Renee and Kamal on Fridays with Renee talking about me being nice to members of male chauvinist murder cults talking to me and, and 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 i shout out to everybody that's messaged me and came and snitched on them and you know and they said a whole but it ain't nothing i mean we've been through this argument back and forth for for the you don't know i'm on uh black power media very honored that they reached out to me and invited me to be part of that network that that organization and i'm on their fridays with with uh geechee and jared ball and um it's called the Earn Your Liberation Show, where the three of us all just sit around complimenting and lifting each other's up as black men. It's just a circle lift. And sometimes the topic of religion comes up. And then when the topic of religion comes up, I spit vomit and rage against religion. And they, everyone's telling me that I cannot help black people, specifically black people who are members of these colonizer religions mainly islam and christianity but you can throw the black hebrews in there the black jews the, the black members of abrahamic religion that i should not condemn mock belittle their beliefs that i should respect their beliefs and they said that my approach doesn't work and they demonstrate that my approach doesn't work because then they point to the thousands of deconverts the thousands of ex-Muslims and ex-Christians and ex-cult members that are all lined up behind them because of their soft peddling, because of their speaking lightly and politely and respectfully about people who have delusional beliefs imposed on us by genocidal colonizers. So they tell me to switch up my flow. They, they like to say, this is my favorite line, I agree with you, I just don't like how you do it. Now, I'm not sophisticated enough and I'm not articulate enough to speak kindly. I don't take kindly to colonize their religions. I don't take kindly to sexist, delusional, apocalyptic belief systems. And I don't know how to say it any other way than a male chauvinist murder cult. And they say that there are people out there who are united with me, who can work with me, who believe as I do, which can't be possible if they are bumping their head on the floor in the mosque or doing the, the chicken dance in the tabernacle. I don't know. That's just like how you believe as I do. But they say, and he and and and, and Kamal said, there are people out there who do more than me, who, who, who are more revolutionary than I am. And I'm like, why are you revolutionary at all? If I believe that this world is just a way station, if my only time here is to exist, to, 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 to live a life that shows that I am worthy of eternity and then afterlife, I would spend all my time evangelizing and spreading the word and been telling people, don't trip off of none of this shit. Wait on the Lord. But OK, you're a revolutionary Christian, a revolutionary Muslim, and they love to name them. They love to love to name past and present 
people who have these reactionary beliefs and tell me, you know, Marcus Garvey was a Christian. Nat Turner was a Christian. You know, Jaleel Mutakin and 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 uh H Rap Brown. You tell me all these uh and I'm like, you asking me how I can condemn the faith of these revolutionary people instead of asking them revolutionary people how they can adhere to revolution and at and and at the same time a reactionary faith. You asking the wrong person the wrong question stop asking me about it i tell people you come tell me nat turner was a christian then if nat turner was a christian and 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 the christianity he believed in were true nat turner is burning in hell show me in the bible what it said a slave should do in relationship to their master does the bible say slave decapitate thy master slave run away from thy master thy thine master Slave, be fruitful and work hard for your master. Obey thy man. What the blood clot does the Bible say about slavery? What does the Bible say? And so if you really want to come to me and be like, you dissing Christianity and you dissing, but Nat Turner was a Christian. I'm like, well, if not, if you believe that Nat Turner was a Christian and if you also believe that the edicts and the consequences of Christianity was true, then Nat Turner burned in hell. Uh, uh, Harriet Tubman, if she was a Christian, she burned in hell. But if she wasn't a Christian, she burns in hell too. Fuck that shit. I don't believe none of that shit. So what I say is, every good person I know is a really bad Christian. Every good black Christian that I know is bad at Christianity. They some cherry pickers. They be reaching and reaching. You ever seen a thorny bush with luscious fruit? And what they do is reach in that thorny bush and pull out the most succulent pieces of fruit. And they'll be like, this is just this. They have their own segment. They have their own personalized dogma, their own personalized theology. And I'm like, fine, but here's the problem. Here's the problem. Don't you know that when you have an institution when you have an institution, because people tell me, I tell people I worked at Rikers Island for three years and I was all over the island and people want to condemn me because I worked at Rikers Island and they were like, oh, that explains a lot. <laughs> Mother fuck you. People say, oh, you worked at Rikers Island. Now, here's the rub. I just passed the exam. I got like an 89 out of 100. Out of the... Uh, um, the National Registry for Radiologic Technologists. And I got my exam. I got my certificate. I got all my this and that. And I said, well, now that I am a professional, I'm a certified professional. I went to, to State University of New York and I'm an allied health professional. I got some letters after my name. And I said, I'm not just going to go up to, to, to uh, Maimonides I'm not going to even go to King's County. I said, I'm going to go where the most vulnerable and oppressed, because this is something I believed all my life. I'm going to go to where the most downtrodden and, 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 and beat down people are to apply my profession, to uh, utilize my skills. So if I would have been a chef, I would have went and worked at a soup kitchen. You know what I'm saying? If I was, I guess if I was a rapper, I'd be one of them grimy, musty backpack uh headphone underground musty basement spitting rappers one of them you know lyrical icons you know catching the, the one of them type of rappers that take public transit to and from my show my name is on the marquee because i'd be rapping for the people you know i wouldn't compromise i wouldn't sell out so i'm like well i'm none of those i'm not some great rapper if i was a ball chaser i'd be craig hodges if I could box, I'd be Muhammad Ali. But since I, I can, I'm a damn good radiographer, I'm going to go work in a prison and work for the people and do that on behalf of the people. Of course, that shit went belly up. But people could tell the same people that condemn me for calling out the male chauvinist murder cult adherents uh, will be like, oh, you worked at Rikers. So you was bad. Regardless, I worked in the infirmary. I provided acute medical care 
for emergency medical care, diagnostic care. I provided medical care for some people who were facing not just the injuries. Everybody know about shanking and, 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 and all of that. But if you know somebody who's in prison, who's been to prison or, or parole from prison, you know, one of the worst things you can encounter in prison is, is, is chronic disease and infection. The, the ventilation system, you got all these people who come in in very poor health, cramped together. Tuberculosis, uh, uh, it ain't a dude I know. I should have some of my homies that have been inside. I don't know. Some of them, like, it's PTSD. They don't like to talk about it, and I don't feel comfortable asking them. I, you know, when my homies want to come talk to me about they, they, they bid and what they went through, I always listen, but I never ask. I never try to pry. But anyway, every single one of I sometimes I feel, you know, I don't want to tell people's business, but they get these skin lesions. These skin lesions and stuff. And you out, people don't really notice because usually when dudes come out of lockup, they come out buff. They come out ripped. And so we just looking at them big ass shoulders and shit, them big ass biceps and shit. And they walking around swole. But if you look, the, the skin lesions, they breed different. They joints are tighter. So if you, you know, I fast and pray to whichever fictional entity you think has power to help you. I fast and pray that nobody ever goes into lockup and nobody gets out, but you're more likely to come out with a lifelong infection, parasites, respiratory, vision issues. People's eyes and Malcolm X had really good sight. He came out, his eyes were ruined. The lighting, the ventilation, the water, the nutrition, the food quality, the sanitation, that's, that is, I'm not even starting with the psychological and emotional trauma. I'm not even gotten up to the, to the stabbings and the beatings and the assaults. Just the environment alone. I saw more tuber active tuberculosis and I was working in a uh, uh, Rosen Singer Center Oh, in the, in the women's prison, Rosen Singer Center. We had to do rotations there because there's all the all the there's several jails there, and there's one juvenile jail, the Gladiator School they called it, and one uh, all female uh, um, lockup called Rosen Singer Center, and all the other GMDC and all the other ones were all male. So um, I would have to go uh, once, maybe I. I don't remember the rotations. It was so long ago. But you one, you'd have to do a week rota week long rotation at the women's facility. And the women's facility, if you think the men's facility was bad, they didn't give these sisters. They were charging them for hygiene products. And all I'm saying is, if you go to jail, everybody fear. Oh, a lot of brothers they joke about it, which I don't think is fucking funny about being assaulted, having their manhood took it. A lot of brothers joke about it's getting the shank. Or, you know, if I got to fight, I'm going to get big. I knew a dude. Grew up with. Known him since we were little kids, and he caught a bid. And he, he started, and it was an ongoing trial. His people had money, so he was able to get out of jail pending the, the trial. He was allowed to, you know, go back to work and stuff. And he was going back in court court date several months haggling with the lawyer haggling having his lawyer haggle with the prostitute uh, prostitution prosecution saying uh, you know i don't want to insult sex sex work um but anyway they gave him I, I, what was it i think 16 months and he could be out in 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 eight months it was a but they sent him to upstate and he had barely over a year but anyway, he went to the state. Not it wasn't even up because we were up. He went south. He was down on the Missouri Tennessee border. But anyway, he started doing karate. He started training in martial arts and lifting weights like crazy, right? And every time I saw him, I want to ask him how how the how the trial was going, what's what's happening, what you're looking at, and he'd be like, I don't have time. I got martial arts class, and I'm gonna hit a, a gym session. And he was working out, put on maybe. 20, 22 pounds of, of lean muscle. And I should have told him, 
I didn't want to add. I'm like, dude, you need to be building up your homo homeostasis. You better get some supplements. You better get some immune boosting. You better eat some 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 immune boosting and and build up your and make sure your auntie and your grandma are able to put some money on your commissary so they can get you so you don't have to eat that 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 denurtured food and get you some if available fresh fruits and vegetables or something because you're more likely and again not joking i don't talk to him anymore so i can tell his business i'm sure he don't watch it but he went into prison he was in lockup he continued to lift weights and, and then he started boxing and stuff and he said you know uh he would read he read a lot he said man you know i read more books in six months in prison than i read in six years in the free world so after that he became an avid reader because he said i'm really ashamed of myself and he's one of them dudes that used to make fun of me and stuff and being a nerd and always in books and stuff and stopping to look at the bookstore when we were roam the mall and uh now he became an avid reader he uh went to college and got a degree in accounting and finance and went about trying to get his record expunged and he won't move to 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 new york to go to wall street and get on wall street and then he became a, a scumbag capitalist or petty bourgeoisie and he was like it's all about making money so anyway and we don't talk no more but all i'm saying is when he came out he had these skin lesions and rashes he infected his baby mama with with this same rash and stuff and and uh he it, you know no no intercourse happened so he said i don't even know how i got it it covered my body i'd go to the, the clinic and they'd give me a pill or an injection and wouldn't even tell me no no consent you know a lot of metal experimentation goes on in these jails you don't have any citizenship's rights they don't have to bother with informed consent there's old books uh acres of skin is probably one of the best known books for all that so anyway Sorry to go down that rabbit hole, but yeah, that's something we don't even think about. I never hear anybody talk about the lifelong chronic diseases and the lifelong infectious and communicable diseases that are caught and spread within prison and by extension to spread throughout our community. And and uh, especially respiratory issues. I say a lot of cats and I just, you know, really it's fucked up. But anyway. All the way back. Let's bring it all the way back. I didn't even mean to get all into that. What I was saying is people would admonish me. It's like, well, I don't care what role you played. I don't care if you worked in the infirmary. I don't care if you were providing health care. You worked for the man. You worked in the jail system. So I'm as bad as the warden, bad as the CEOs, bad as the judge and the prosecutor. I'm bad as the, the uh, uh, legislators who wrote the draconian laws to for mass and car i'm as bad as the rest of them right you know none of the prisoners took that position i had very good relationships because most of them cats in there even though it was in east elmhurst a lot of them cats came from my neighborhood that i was living in in brooklyn and i would run into a lot of cats because with rikers remember it's people awaiting trial and people been sentenced to next city less than a year so over 80 percent of rikers inhabitants will be out in a year or less and if they get more than a year then they get sent upstate so i'd be at ebbets field when they had that big basketball court I, that was my place where i would play at at ebbets field after uh i couldn't afford to, I, I didn't want to play there i just didn't have any options you know but i would play at ebbets field and every time i go there and dudes would come to me and tell me what cell block they were on but i wouldn't remember but I always got love and they, they would tell me, which made me feel good, helped my self-esteem. It's like, yo, you treated us better than the than the than the hospitals and clinics in the streets. But anyway, the same people that tell me I can't be work in a prison infirmary and not be culpable for the entire mass incarceration system, the role I play. But you could be a Muslim and have nothing to do with colonization, slavery, mutilization and 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 uh anti-africanism you can be a christian and not carry the history and reality of christianity the same people have said that now the same people that side eye me 
when I said I worked, I was on staff. I, they would call us civilians. They treated us like shit too. And they would beat us up. And I mean, you'd be surprised how many doctors and physicians assistants and nurses and phlebotomists and HIV counselors got assaulted by uh, um, prison guards. The guards, the CEOs, they're not guards anymore. They're corrections officers. Remember, it's, it's not a prison. It's a correctional institute. And you're not a prisoner. You're an inmate. <laughs> and so those weren't guards. They were corrections officers. And so the corrections officers to a person, even the, the white staff members who believe that every man locked up in Rikers Island is, is gets what they deserve, lock them up and throw away the key to a person. They were more in fear of and intimidated by um, the guards than they were the inmates. And there were three assaults on medical workers and clinical workers while I was there. And all three of them were well one of them was two staff members a civilian staff and two civilian staff but the other two uh was a were guards attacking civilians and they would call us civilians and when we would come in they would even though all the end there were several incidents there was an incident where one guy walked a female prisoner out of rosen singer center brought her a co uniform brought her a fake badge and walked her up out of there. There was another time where this dude brought two pistols into there. And so the, the guards would walk around the metal detectors like Remy Ma. They walked around the metal detectors and, um, but we had, we got completely shook down. They would search our belongings. They would search our person. We'd have to go through the metal detect. We went through all the same screenings as the visitor. It wasn't at heart. There weren't like cavity searches and stuff with the inmates, but they treated us pretty much as they would the visitors. And we would come through the same scrutiny coming and going, coming and going. And the shitty ass, uh, uh, shift, uh, supervisor, even though you could get to work well on time, you could show up to your, your station late because they hemming you up at the, at the gate. But if you were hemmed up at the gate, they would tell us to make that your time. And I mean, and let me tell you something else about this wage society. I think from the moment your alarm goes off, you should be on the clock. If I'm getting up, brushing my teeth, showering, putting on deodorant, putting on my fly clothes, gathering up, making myself a lunch to come work for you. I, you should be paid for that whole time. You should be paid for waking up, prep, coming and going to work. The work you do and then for the commute home, you should get paid that whole fucking time. Because many of the time about you, I work an eight hour day. People out here working 12 hour days. And if you got to drop your kids off on the way, then pay for that shit, too. And if you wake up and you just getting yourself ready, maybe it could be a different rate. If you're in and in, in, in the mothers out here waking up, getting a half a dozen kids ready. In my world, so vote for me. I have you paid nonstop it 24 seven. They should pay for your whole damn everything. Pay for you to sleep too. Cause you're resting up to go to work. So if you go to bed at night, you should be still on the clock. If the next day you got to wake up and go to work. Cause you only sleep. And if you didn't have to go to work tomorrow, you probably be up, you know, eating Cheetos, binge watching your show. So if you sleeping the night before work, they should pay you because you sleeping for them. You ain't sleeping for yourself. Let me tell you, the, the days I don't have to get up in the morning, if me and my wife ain't binge watching Naked and Afraid because we enjoy watching white folks suffer voluntarily, if we not watching Naked and binge watching Naked and Afraid, sipping organic vegan wine, then I'm I'm on my my new gaming computer playing Age of Empire or 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 modded uh, modded out uh, games. Warhammer, I'm playing modded Warhammer games. Y'all fighting for 15. Think big, bitch. What's that thing? What was that thing going around? Think big, bitch. Stop fighting for 15. Fight for everything. What the fuck is that? We so beat down. That's some peasant shit. More, sir? More, sir? the fuck is that? Fight for 15. That's some weird shit. Not that I wouldn't take. Give me 15. I'll take it. I can get five. I don't get 15. If I tallied up all my time doing this thing, it don't equate to 15. So I'm, 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 uh, 
Naked and Afraid. Naked and Afraid, we watch it on uh, Max on one of the streaming things. So I don't watch it live. I just, you can't binge watch it. But I don't know if they're doing new seasons. My wife and I were out of town, and that was on the Hotel Basic Cable. And I'm like, look at these white folks. They volunteering for this shit. The white folks got it too easy. <laughs> White folks got it too. If this is what they're doing for fun, life is too God. Y'all done stole too much. You know you stole too much from the masses, from the world. And if you if your 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 idea of a challenge and fun is is going out, the fucking fur to land snakes biting at you and shit. Oh my gamer tag. You wanna know my gamer tag on stream? I don't know. I just stay signed in. Let me see. I'll check that later. I'll share my gamer tags later because I don't pull it up. But it's Mace Zulu. But it could be Maze Zulu, M A Z E Zulu, or Mace, M A C E Zulu, like Mace Windu. It's either one of those because one is my Xbox gamer tag and the other is my Steam gamer tag. But I don't know. But what, am, what are we doing here? <laughs> oh, I was talking about these motherfuckers. Let me not say, let me clean it up. Listen. All you people tripping off of my position on a male chauvinist murder cult. Stop telling me to be more sensitive and tell them to stop enslaving, stop colonizing, stop indoctrinating, stop mutilating, stop molesting. Everybody tripping off of me and my position on religion. And unless you come to me and y'all do that shit. People come and tell me the African origins of Islam, the African origins of Christianity, and not one of them people are engaged or practicing the or original version of it. I don't care if the origins are in Africa because that's not what you that's not what you're practicing. That's like me saying the origins of democracy started in Africa and pretending like that got shit to do with me being a citizen of the United States. What that got to do with a goddamn thing? The origins of humanity started, the origins of life started in the oceans. Go be a fish. That's good. And let me tell you, all this, this is what I usually say when I want to be slick, but I don't say stuff like that anymore because people are saying if I'm nicer about it, if I talk about the atrocities and the colonization and mass delusions of religion, if I say nicer things, then more people will say, hey, you know what? This thing I believe in that that's more important to me than my than life itself. This thing that I believe that I think not only will I do it now, but I'm going to do it for all eternity. This thing, you know, because you were so polite, I'm going to abandon it. I'm going to let it go. <laughs> but I used to say when people come to me, you know, the original Jews was black. Origins of Christianity, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the Holy Trinity. The Holy Mother, Isis, Osiris, that bullshit acting like that's the origins of Christianity. I always say the origins of shit is food. The origins of species is food. And what do you do? Who cares about the origins when you're standing in the middle of the outcome? So flush that shit, because that shit, even if you believe that the origins were Africans, which they ain't, they are not, and not even Ethiopian. Ethiopian church was not the first Christian church, even though I acknowledge that the Ethiopian Coptic church is evolved parallel with the Western faith. It's much older than they give it credit for. It wasn't started there. Go look up the first Bishop of Axum, the very first highest saint in the Ethiopian church and look that dude up and tell me if that piece of, tell me if that in, historical individual was a black man, was an African, even had African. Go look up the first Bishop, the founder, the father, the, 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 the father of the Coptic Ethiopian African Christianity, which is the oldest Christian church, the oldest Christian faith, the oldest Christian community with the oldest Christian artifacts and the oldest Christian architecture on the continent of Africa. They were Christians before even the Romans converted. 
before the Greek Orthodox, before the founding of the of the Catholic Church, these African people were, were, were doing Holy Ghost tabernacle dances. And you tell me, the man who came to bring them the light of Christ, the first Bishop of Oxon, St. Fermides, and tell me if that's an African. And tell me where he came from. And he didn't learn Christianity in Africa. He brought it there. It was in his pocket when he got there. But let's keep it. All I'm saying is all y'all tripping off of me, asking me why I'm attacking the church instead of asking the goddamn church why it's attacking us. You're asking the wrong person the wrong questions. If you want to know, don't ask me, how am I attacking uh, uh, Christianity when we got Christian revolutionaries? How am I attacking Islam when we got black Islam Muslim revolutionaries? Instead of asking the revolutionaries, how the hell are you revolutionary in Islam? I'd be, and then come tell me why. See if it makes sense. God damn it. And I wasn't going to say none of this. They talking me and then don't say my name. Let me tell you something in the future. I'm a tree hugging vegan. You don't just say my name, like me and Beyonce. Say my name, say my name. You want to talk about my approach and question my authenticity. Ain't the damn thing changed. Say my name, Kamal. Say my name, say my name. Go on and say it. You have nothing to fear. I ain't going to bang on tables. I'm not going to, I ain't going to, it's all intellectual. It's all ideological. And let me tell you one more thing, because this is another lie they told on me, though. I shouldn't be told. What time is it? Oh, God, I got to respect myself. We got to talk about elections. Erections. <laughs> I should have put erections on there just to trick y'all and then talk about. But what? <laughs> he lied and said, I don't work with Muslims and I don't work with Christians because they. I have never. I have never. Now, the only thing I've ever rejected a Muslim or a Christian is. I could not be in an intimate, long-term relationship with a Muslim or a Christian. Now, that's some. Now, if you want to talk about, that's the only thing. If I met a woman who was uh, Islamic, if I met a sister who, who's, you know, I ain't trying to do threesomes with Christ. If, if Jesus, if you believe Jesus is walks with you, and when he, when 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 you can't carry it no more. If we in the bedroom and you screaming, oh, God, oh, Jesus, and you really think that that's it ain't just a spastic thing, but you generally calling them into the room. I can't have God in my business like that. All I'm saying is that's the only way. That's the only place. I'm not saying don't date. I'm saying I can't. Now, my wife, me and her have debates because she's agnostic. She does accept that there is a chance or a potential. She's not religious. She's not a Christian. She's not a Muslim. She's not a spiritualist, but she is an agnostic. She's like, just because we don't know something does not mean there can't be the possibility of the supernatural. She leaves herself open to a potential or a chance for the supernatural. And if she engages in and in, 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 in encounters the supernatural, she will not reject it and all that. So she's an agnostic. You know, and she thinks she's going to get in heaven with that. She's going to be with me all my life and she's going to be with me in hell because that ain't going to cut it. Oh, I'm an agnostic. I didn't say there was no God. <laughs> but her favorite quote, she says, in the absence of knowing, anything is possible. So the things that we don't know for sure in that arena of the unknown, it could be divine. It could be supernatural. It could be, you know, anything. That's what. But, you know, it's just some junk. So I've been trying to bring her on over to an absolute rejection of the supernatural. But so she's an agnostic. I'm an atheist. And my sons, not anything I've done, because I, again, I'm very liberal. And we're going to talk about my liberalism. Been very liberal with my sons. My oldest son is an atheist and my youngest son is an agnostic. So. And my oldest, my youngest son used to be a worshiper of Ra. He used to think the sun was God. And he said the sun gives us life. And he was learning about the solar system and learning about the sun and the energy of the sun and the Earth's relationship in the solar system and the Goldilocks zone and how the sun, without the sun, there'd be no life and couldn't sustain life and, and photosynthesis. So when he was a little kid, he was like, 
you know, when people say to God, it's actually sun. And I'm like, well, you're going about 1750 different hells for worshiping the sun, you primitive. But he's let that go. He's like the sun is just a nuclear generator. It's a, it's a it's a heavenly body, but it's not divine, you know. Because now he went to learn about physics and astronomy. So he's like, okay, the sun is not a supernatural force. It's not a conscious or deliberate force. And so anyway, this is my problem. Dude said, I don't work with. Now I will work with anyone depending on the task. I've never said or looked at anyone says, I won't work with you because you're a Muslim. I won't work with you because you're a Christian. I won't work with you because you're Hindu. I won't work with you because you're Muslim. I won't work with you because you're some spiritualist system, some spirituality you made up out of thin air. Never done that. I've had that done to me. I've had people say, because I don't believe in their delusions, I'll work with anybody. I've worked with members of the Nation of Islam, I've worked with the entire mosque in Kansas City. Had very good relationships with, I think it was Mosque 47, right off Troost, right off 47th and Troost, Muhammad's Mosque, Kansas City, Missouri, and National Black United Front. And the mosque had a very close relationship. And that's why when they had their uh, national, uh, Imbuff National Convention came to Kansas City, uh, Minister Farrakhan Man was the keynote speaker now of course i didn't get a vote on that <laughs> you know. but anyway the very close relationship never refused to do work never refused to play my role never never broke organizational discipline always held to the protocols always held to the agenda so never refused when i came here one of the first people i worked with before he was brought up on federal charges was professor uh not professor uh uh what's his name minister uh who's that apostolic min uh finney reverend finney and the first two organic community gardens i set up in this city were on church grounds no one wasn't on the church grounds it was actually on property owned by the church because you'd be surprised how many of these blighted lots so it was from the moment i touched ground here and one of the first organizations I founded, grassroots organization, from the Chicago Agenda to the Bloom Cooperative, we opened uh, uh, cooperative enterprises. We came up with, with uh, what did we do? So much shit. But when we were doing the uh, the Achosi and Fitness Freedom Fighters and 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 doing the uh, Interesting Thoughts event promotion, and like I said, the two cooperative enterprises. Uh, Quantum Studio 1, Quantum Studio 2, and then quant the first Quantum Studio became Insight Studios. All that shit was with Black Hebrew Israelite. You know? So, I've always been willing to do the work. But one thing I'm not willing to do is bite my tongue. There's no way any belief system, any institution, any organization, any faith can have an unyielding, unbroken history of hyper-exploitation of my people. And I'm going to censor myself. Like I said, if you put it on the table, everybody gets a bite. If you put it on the table, don't put it on the table if everybody can't take a bite at it. So if I walked into an organization and meeting and we, whatever we were meeting for, whatever we were doing, and the moment you want to pour libations or open with a prayer, you've opened the door, not me, to critique and criticisms of that prayer, those libations and everything else. So if we were having, when we had one of our interesting thoughts uh, events, this is way back with Troy Davis, and we were doing outreach and education, I insisted that all the food be vegan. I said, well, we were sitting, we're gonna have, we, we, we secured the venue, we designed the flyers, we set up the, the speakers list, everything's set up to do this thing. And I think if we're gonna have food and refreshments, it should all be vegan, organic, quality food. And everybody in that meeting was like, fuck you. And everybody got a chance to say, no, I don't want this vegan shit, boom, 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 boom. I wasn't offended, I wasn't hurt. And when I walked into the venue, 
I was disgusted. They got goddamn chicken wings and shit and all that dead animal carcasses passing it out to the hood as if we ain't got enough chronic disease. And, and you know what I did? I played my role. I didn't get to eat that night. So I eat ahead. Or I eat after. But I walked through that door. I played my role. And when the people started talking about this veganism shit and that's white folks. And when people started expressing their views, their positions, their opinions, their experiences related to veganism. I can't be like, well, y'all, uh, y'all heard this is some fundamental to my identity. Woo, woo, woo. I was like, oh, I had to hear them out because I put the shit on the table. Because I put the shit on the table. Nobody ran up to me and be like, hey, tap me on the shoulder, bro, Diallo, you vegan. And let me tell you what I think. I said, listen, I'm a member of this organization and I'd like to propose that we all go vegan for this event and just give the people some healthy alternatives, help promote veganism. And they were like, this ain't what this about. Police out here killing us and eating cherries and apples and berries ain't going to save us from the cops. Kill. And I got, I heard an earful. I heard it. I accepted it. I disagreed with it vehemently. I articulated my position. I heard their position. And then I'm like, let's continue on with the greater mission. And if you were in an organization and you want to say let's open with a prayer let's pour some libations on my faith or i can't do this or because of ramadan we shouldn't have food at the event you have opened your personal faith up for public scrutiny within an organizational context so and guess what i also i don't do i don't go on the radio station there are christian radio stations online and all around here there are islamic reading rooms and there's christian science reading rooms and islamic study groups and mosques and guess what i do i don't go there that's i do don't go there i don't set foot in those fucking spaces when i'm online i got some leisure time and i want to listen to a uh, uh youtube video while i load the dishwasher right or I'm playing a video game and I want to have something playing in the background. I don't play sermons from the imams or the ministers. I might pay an old lecture. So I don't engage with that shit because it doesn't speak to me. I'm not interested. I don't agree with it. If I'm going to listen to something related to religion, I'm going to listen to Aaron War, Or I'm going to listen to Professor Williams Mackey's breakdown of the history of Christianity. And its impact on us. I'm going to listen to Chancellor Williams' lecture on Islam and the atrocities in the, of the Islamic slave trade. But people come voluntarily to me of their own free will, their own volition, and click on one of my videos. <laughs> and then come to me and be like, how dare you say that? And I say, how dare you click on it? The fuck is wrong with you? And I've on my show, I've had Muslims on here. I've had Christians on here. I had ethereal. If you go back to the Bro Diallo archives, I've had spiritualists. I've had Rastas to dialogue. I had comedic priestesses, sex positive comedic priestesses on. I'll talk in dialogue with anybody. But God damn it, I'm not going to play. I mean, you can't, you don't come on the Bro Diallo show to promote or evangelize my audience. You come on the Di Bro Diallo show for critique, to educate the community and to critique, radical critique. I had a, a black Hebrew fly all the way in from, from Israel, come on my show and explain to people how to get Israeli late, uh, citizenship how to convert, find a rabbi or a local synagogue, how to convert, get Israeli citizenship and go get you one of them Palestinian houses. And she laid it out. She did it. And, he, and then she left. And the only reason she left Israel, not because of the genocide, she left Israel because her oldest son became old enough for military service. And, and, and you have to you get conscript. So she, the, the government was like, yo, you got to send us your oldest son. He's got to be in the IDF. And she's like, I ain't about to put my son in the military. She packed up her whole family and then moved to the African continent. Came on my show, laid her shit out. I asked her questions. Didn't softball shit. And I had another brother, good friend of mine, 
good friend of mine. We've been friends from this freshman year of high school. And we stay in contact here and there. He's become, he used to be in corporate America too. Damn, I know so many corporate brothers. He went to the corporate world and was like, it's racist. I don't like this corporate world. Went to the high fashion world, became a fashion designer. And then he, he said that he was depressed. He was suicidal and he found spirituality. And he has this high level, high principled spiritual system that he's cultivated, drawing from several uh, uh, esoteric belief systems and several religions. And he wrote two books on it. And he said, bro, Diallo, I know you do book reviews. I'm going to send you an advanced copy of my new book. And I want you to read it. And I'm going to come on your show and talk about it. So I'm like, right on. Very smart brother. I probably wouldn't have a high school diploma if it were two dudes. Him. I'll tell you his name. Evans. Evans Cooper, the third, because he, he's bourgeois. He come from money. You know, his brother. I went to a private school. I lived in the projects. So I got my hood friends and I got my private school friends from back in the day. He was one of my private school friends. So he's a third. You know, he, know, he knew who his daddy was and his daddy's daddy knew who his daddy was. I mean, shout out. But anyway, but I'm only saying his name because he's a public figure, a public author. And you can go read his book. But, dude, and I had another friend, Chet Kenyungi, this Kenyan cat. And they used to come knock on my door sometimes, especially Chet. And if I didn't, it's like, I ain't going to school today. They come knock on my door and Chet be like, come to school. And he had them big Kenyan smile. You ever see a Kenyan smile? will fucking blind you. Where they get that dentition from? God damn. But anyway. Uh, dude wrote this book. I read the book and I'm like, yo, E. I said, if you come on my show, it's not going to be a pretty interview. And he was like, what? And I was like, listen. I read your book and not only do I have some issues with it, I think my audience would have a lot of issues with a lot of your positions and claims. And he was like, really? I'm surprised. I said, yeah. I said, dude, I'm an atheist. And he's like, he's like, I knew he's like, but you are vegan because I was off the swine. And, you know, he was like, I always kind of thought you were a spiritual dude because you didn't eat meat and you would be on all this pro black and positivity and African tradition. So I thought you'd be responsive. to. I'm like, nah. None of that. Don't don't let this veganism fool you. You know, this is not my I'm, I'm about animal rights and animal liberation and holistic health and all that shit. But none of the all my shit is science based. None of it's higher mind, higher self type shit. So he's like, you know, from my system, we don't debate our system. We don't debate our beliefs. We don't we don't go back and forth. We only go into places where we are received with open arms. And I'm like, if that's your belief system, you you can't. And so I was looking forward to having him on. I was going to do a book review, but he is like, I'd prefer not to engage non-confrontational. And I respect that. And you know why? Because his belief system is not colonizing anybody's country. His belief system does not call for decapitation and cutting off of limbs. His belief system does not call for Armageddon. And does not say that our salvation comes from the stars. But he does say that there are supernatural forces, otherworldly forces, ancestral forces, other dimensional forces that can aid you in your life and improve your life. I think it's utter and complete quackery to be nice. But it's not in a colonizing, it's not imperialist, it's not oppressive. And it could be. And if it became that, if his shit started resonating and started getting around the world and became one of the world religions, I'd call it out too. But it ain't there yet. It's not even a cult because he doesn't even gather people around. He's like, you, these are some techniques, some skills and some philosophies. And you take it yourself and you go off and do it yourself. You don't come around. He don't bring people around him. He, there's no leader. There's no hierarchy articulated within the book. And, you know, if I was to believe in the supernatural, I'd probably do it that way. Like I said, religion is uh, I mean, spirituality is religion for lazy people. So I don't have to adhere to no holidays. I don't have to restrict my diet. I don't have to dress no type of way. I don't have to refrain from intercourse or fast. None of that shit. Anyway. All I'm saying is people coming here voluntarily. I do not reject religion religious people i do not even attack religious people i reject any and all manifestations of oppression racism 
exploitation. And every religion I, that I have issue with has engaged in deliberate direct. And if you are an adherent to that religion, then you can't exhibit yourself. I can't go join the Crips tomorrow. And if, if I join the Crips, if I never do a drive by, oh, I was going to say this shit about the bees. Let me go back to that. If you look at a beehive, not all bees sting. Not all bees make honey or go out and forage for nectar. Every bee pays a role. And the non-stinging bees are as crucial to sustaining and helping the, the hives uh, to sustain itself as the stinging bees. So if you are a Christian and you don't molest kids, you don't colonize country, you're not racist, you don't talk about people's demon souls, you don't condemn uh, gays and homosexual, uh, gays and homosexual, you don't uh, condemn gender non-conforming people to the to Hades. Even if you don't do that shit, even if you don't fly out to collect nectar, you give legitimacy and support to the institution and the system that does that. I am a U.S. citizen. I would never join the military. I could never join the military. One soldier to another. Holla if you hear me. I'm a black man and I can never be a veteran. I would never join the military. I would never become a law enforcement officer, whether through policing, through prosecution or any other way. But I carry the burden as an African, as a member of the African diaspora, who is also a citizen of the United States. To of all of the atrocities that of the past, present and future of this country. I owe a debt to the rest of the world as a U.S. citizen for the atrocities of this nation that I hold citizenship in. So I have to articulate my opposition to the state and I have to take deliberate action to challenge, subvert, and wherever I can upend the, 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 the atrocities. I can't just sit back and be like, well, I ain't in it. I ain't do it. That's just not how healthy people, how uh, that's just not appropriate. It's just not appropriate. So shit, and I didn't volunteer for this. You know, shit. I didn't ask to come. And the two people that brought me here, it was a complete accident. You know, sometimes I just sit and talk to my wife. Like, neither one of my parents are 20 years older than me. <laughs> the, you know, neither one. Both of my parents, neither of my parents had were 20 years old. Or neither one of my parents. My mom is only, I think, what is she? she's 17 years older than me. And my dad is 16 years older than me. So I didn't ask to be here and my parents barely were barely legal to even bring me here. But even though I was born into this shit right here, I was born into this. I still got to carry away. But just imagine if I volunteer for some shit, if I voluntarily, consciously and deliberately join up with some shit. I walk in because I when I was baptized, I was baptized at 12 years old. But imagine being a fully formed adult with a fully formed adult mind and your ass walk into a church and profess your sins and get baptized. You walk into a mosque. Little John just converted to Islam. They can have him. They say, imagine volunteering. And I can't, I can't, I ain't even got it. I wanted to join the nation of Islam. They rejected me first. Real talk. Who was it? Sage and, and, and Kanif. But anyway, they didn't want no parts of me. I talked too much. I spoke out of turn. I won't even get into the story about when they locked me out of the, 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 the NOI study group. It's a funny story, but I ain't going to get ain't got time. I'm already indulging myself. I ain't even got ne nowhere near the topic. Um, But anyway, I hope this helps y'all understand. If you hold to colonial religions. That don't mean we can't get together and dig ditch and break bread together. But I think it's funny because 
if that's really what you believe, how can I raise any criticisms or questions about your belief that you haven't done yourself? Believe you me, I've been a vegan since 1992. And anybody that's anti-vegan or think vegan is stupid or think, believe me, there's no criticism, critique of veganism. No issues with vegans and the kind of bullshit vegans do, vegan individuals and vegan organizations have done that I haven't already carried that critique. If I believe in some shit, believe you me, you can't come to me with a criticism that I haven't already carried. Because that's a, like my wife. You can't come to me and give me no uh, uh, tea on my wife. Because nobody pays more attention to her. Nobody pays more scrutiny to her. And my kids, you, don't, you can't come to, uh, uh, bro, Diallo, your son was up the block. I know immediately. I'm like, yeah, I know. I, you right. You can, If you do come tell me something about my child, it ain't going to shock me or upset me because I know my sons. I'm going to go out on the limb. They could be fooling me. I've been watching these dudes my whole life. Their 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 assets and their shortcomings. Because that's what my that's what my life revolves around, right? So if I come to you, how can I come tell you some shit about Islam that you haven't already looked into yourself? And I'm not talking about the 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 hadith. I'm not talking about uh 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 uh, the the history and all this shit. I'm not even talking about this. I'm talking about, you know, I got books. I got the Matunate. I got books on African religion and spiritual systems and symbols and rituals. I got books on, I'm not even interested in that shit. I just look at it because I'm like, if I'm going to be tearing shit down, so no way if I was a Muslim, somebody come and talk about the Islamic slave trade, patriarchy and sexism, mutilation, North African colonization and expansionism, the oil oligarchies. No way somebody can come talk to me about any of that and I'm going to be mad because I'm like, oh, you don't know the half of it. I should suspect when I come and talk to people about Christianity. And the ongoing offenses of Christianity and the brand new evangelical recolonization uh, and the spread of evangel evangelical reactionary Christian faith and, and prosperity ministry. Ain't no way. If you were a true Christian, you'd be like, bro, you don't know half of it. Let me let, let me tell you, it goes deeper than you thought. But you want to skate around the surface of something you claim your whole life revolves around and your afterlife revolves around. The only reason I'm an atheist is because I looked honestly at religion. It, I'm not an atheist because I rejected religion. I'm an atheist because I fully embrace that shit. Most people that become atheists were the, were once truer believers. They We didn't play around at the periphery. We didn't just look for the good shit. We wanted to know the whole fucking story. Most atheists were true believers. Because no way you can be a good principled person and know the teachings, the dogma, the rituals, the documented history, and the ultimate outcome, vision, and, and, and destiny of these belief systems and say you are a moral and ethical person and you still adhere to that shit. That's wild to me. And there was a day where there wasn't one African black Christian or black Muslim on the face of the earth. And that's the day I seek to return. for. That's my mission. And I know it might be generations, but that's what I seek to do. And y'all tell me I can't do it. Just imagine those invaders. Imagine those Islamic invaders. That crossed the, 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 the sands and looked upon Africans, pre-colonial Africa. And said, we're going to make them Muslims. And probably there was a Muslim there that's like, you know what? Mm -mm. You're not going to get them to abandon their gods, their faith, their tradition, their rituals, their ancestors. You ain't going to be able to do that. How can you do that? These people have gods older than ours. They have multitude of gods. They have a multitude of temples. They got scrolls that are older than our existence. How are you going to get them to worship Allah? 
How are you going to get them to reject their African identities and adopt an Arabic identity? So there were naysayers on both sides. Imagine a motherfucker on the hull of a ship, the Portuguese, standing on the hull of a ship. And you say, you see that land? We about to, I'm about to make all them motherfuckers Christian while I beat the shit out of them. It's like, listen, if you want to convert them to what you believe, you can't be disrespectful of them. Because that's what they told me. That's what, what, what Kamal Franklin said. I, I got to be nice to convert people. Motherfuckers converted us with whips and chains. They gave us Christian names and made us bow to their gods while brutalizing us. While exterminating us. But I can't get black people convert black people with, with honest words. And I, you know, uh, uh, Ajamu Wester, he was my chairman for my entire time as a member of the National Black United Front. He was the Kansas City chapter chair. And he used to always say, Bro Diallo, you're way too articulate to be using such profane language. And basically, he was like, Stop cussing. And I said, Brother Ajamu, please tell me the how to describe profane conditions without profane language. Please give me the, the, the appropriate supplement for motherfucker and I'll use it. I haven't found it yet. So if you have the appropriate substitute for motherfucker, I'll use that word for atrocity. For male chauvinist murder cult. What's the nice way to say that? Because it must be said at every opportunity. And I digress. Let's move on. The mental of the black man has been torn. I want to talk a little. Let me just get to this. And then I'm going to open it up. I want to talk about liberalism. But maybe I'll save that for Wednesday. With the. Uh, with the. Uh, with the. Skip. I think Skip and I are going to take that up. Because I do want to have Q&A. That's my favorite part. So I'm going to talk about the elections coming up and y'all get y'all y'all mad, greasy and slick. I will be voting tomorrow. I will be strolling to the polls and I will be voting for I'm going to tell y'all who I vote for. I was going to do a pre-election uh, show and uh, and, you know, everybody was like, yeah, yeah, we'd like to do a pre-election show. But then I wasn't even thinking about the primary election which is tomorrow. I'm thinking in November. But I figured I speak about this. I'm going to tell y'all who I'm going to vote for and what I'm going to vote for and why I'm going to vote for it. And I encourage every black person who has the capacity to vote in the U.S. election to do so. Stop talking this nonsense to black people about voting. We have, I don't know why my glasses keep fogging up. But what do I say about U.S. politics? African people must be cold, distant, and calculated. Cold, distant and calculating when it comes to U.S. politics. U.S. politics for African people is not about patriotism. It's not about savior. It's about extracting resources, disrupting agendas, and harm reduction. When you vote or you engage U.S. politics, it is not because you believe that the U.S. political system is legitimate, that you believe that the U.S. Uh, uh, state is your friend or will take care of you. It is that because the United States governing system, state, local, uh, uh, national, and even international bodies, because when you vote, um, you do have a some more indirect on appointees and appointees go all over the world. Ambassadors go all over the world and voting does have impacts. Voting has consequences. Voting can reduce negative have re uh, reduce some impacts on your life, uh, some negative aspects of living under white hegemony and capitalism. Voting can give you more maneuverability. Voting can 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 provide some level of relief. Voting can demonstrate to the community the value of organization, education, and and strategy. Voting can also demonstrate to our enemies 
and give to our enemies the fact that we do have certain grasp and understanding of certain processes. Dr. Bobby E. Rice said African people, black people have been in this country longer than anybody and understand it the least. There is a lot of empty rhetoric about voting and what voting means and what voting can bring to the people and what voting doesn't bring to the people. You're not going to be able to vote for reparations on a national scale. You can do that regionally and locally. And people get mad about reparations. And that's one of the things that they bring up in every election cycle. They get mad at the Democrats because the Democrats don't adequately support reparations. And they never say shit about the Republicans, even though the Republicans position is not only that African people don't deserve reparations, but they were like Bill Cosby said. Because, you know, Bill Cosby said that we owe a debt. Bill Cosby said that African people actually betrayed white people. Bill Cosby said we didn't keep up our end of the bargain. But I digress. I ain't going to get into Bill Cosby. Today. Anyway. So, black people, we should be cold, distant, and calculating. We don't vote for politicians or personalities. We vote to advance policies and interest. We vote to advance policy and interest, or we can sometimes vote to retract a policy or scuttle a policy. Sometimes you can vote for a policy, have that policy uh, implemented, and then you have to circle back for enforcement. Politics is not about liberation. U.S. political system, you can liberation and revolution is not on the ballot. So you have to do that shit elsewhere. You only are seeking for competent bureaucrats. You don't vote for leaders. A representative is not even someone who represents you. A representative is someone who carries out the policies. African people should not have any loyalty to any politician and have no loyalty to any party. Neither party has earned our loyalty. Every election cycle should be a reevaluation. Even if you're registered to one of the parties, when you go in that ballot box, you should be independent in your thinking and election, right? So let me just go into this, this uh, voting. First, I want to talk about it's a primary election and uh let me see some of this stuff i'm gonna say for wednesday tune into the rational radicals on wednesday <gasps> it's not here whatever uh the link isn't even here so tomorrow when i go to vote i have to vote in the democratic and republican primary so i get to vote for the republican or democratic nominee right so i will be voting for um Dean Phillips. Um, I would have preferred to vote for the Green Party. I would have preferred to vote for what's his name? Cornell West. Such a disappointment. But he's not on the ballot. He did not make it onto the Cook County or Illinois ballot. So I, I'm going to vote for Dean Phillips. And the reason I'm voting for Dean Phillips as a Democrat, he's a Democrat. One reason I'm voting for him because it's a vote against Joe Biden. Uh that's the main reason I'm voting for him. But so I don't want to leave it blank. But the reason I'm voting for Dean Phillips, is because his policy, his platform, this is the only thing you should focus on. Anytime you fucking with any politician. Um, I mean, I'll share it. Uh, okay. So in the primary, I'm voting for a Democrat, Dean Phillips, because I want to vote against and I would like for the numbers to reflect. So if you're in Chicago, you there are several other uh, votes, but I'll vote for Dean Phillips and he wants Medicare for all. Uh, he's for higher wages. The worst thing about him is his immigration bill. I'm not going to click on these links. I've been reading all these links all day. The the the. Uh, his immigration reform, he wants to strengthen the border and all that shit, typical cracker shit. But climate change, he says he wants to, you know, um, um, institute women's right to, to abortion. So 
most of these things, as far as a bureaucrat, I agree with. I don't like his immigration reform. It is a nationalist border security policy. It's fucked up as hell. Uh, but most of his policies are, you know, accepted. Right? Um, I don't know what he's talking about. I've been voting in straight. We can get in that in the q and I hope you stick around. Let me let me star this. Um, so that's that. Uh, the more important thing, because the the primary election in, in, in Cook County is a throwaway. Now, some of you might have Green Party candidates and, and, and Progressive Party candidates. So here's the rule of thumb. Your opposition to the Democrats needs to be to the left, should be to the left. If you go to the right in opposition of the Democrats, you are part of the problem. So opposition, if you oppose the Democrats, which I do, but I oppose the Democrats from the left. I go to the left. I will vote green. I will vote progressive. I will vote independent if that independent is a leftist. I will not, in my opposition to the to the Democrats, vote Republican, vote Libertarian, vote Patriot, because if you go to the right, you are going deeper. You are going from the frying pan to the fire. You have not. You are a bad person doing a bad thing. All black opposition to the Democratic Party is only valid. If you hate Joe Biden, you should also hate Trump. You cannot say, I hate Joe Biden, therefore I am supporting Trump. That's like saying, I hate poison, so I'm going to drink venom. I do not think that they are the same. Poison and to be venomous and to be poison. If something is venomous, when it bites you, that's how it attacks you. If something is poisonous, when you bite it. So even though venom and poison can kill you, they attack you in different ways. And the delivery systems are different. And to say they are the same can put you in grave danger. To say that they are the same can put you into grave danger. So this is not an argument in favor of the Democratic Party or the Republican Party. This is a rational, sober assessment of the reality of U.S. political infrastructure. So anyway, I'm going to vote Dean Phillips. When you go to the polls, if you're asking me if they because I live in a uh, basically um, Cook County uh, and Chicago is a Democratic stronghold. So my options tend to be limited. If you live outside of like a Republican or Democratic stronghold, you guys have a lot more options. You might even have Socialist Party members. But it's important to go and show your distaste. You can hurt Biden more by going to vote in favor of his a vote in favor of a Democrat that is opposing him. It sends him an indirect and even a direct message. I wish I was somewhere where I could vote Green Party candidate or Progressive Party candidate, but I'm not in a place. So I'm going to vote for a unknown Democrat because that allows me to send a shout out because every Democrat you see on there that's not Joe Biden is bucking the Democratic establishment. And remember, you can vote for disruption. You can vote to disrupt the machine. So anyway, that's what I'm doing strategically. Um, I do, and I don't just do to say, well, I'm going to vote anybody but him because even though I'm voting for him and it's a symbolic, it's not really symbolic because there's some real shit on this ballot, but it's, it's symbolic in that I want to send a message to the Democratic establishment that you're hand-picked Christian candidate ain't fuck them. But anyway, so moving on. I'm voting for um, the attorney. 
Now, this is this is an important vote. This is a vote that directly impacts my community. This is a vote that now if you've been watching the Bro Diallo show, right? Uh, you've known that I am a I, I happily voted for Kim Fox. I don't want to vote for heroes, for saviors. None of my heroes appear on stamps. I don't vote for revolutionaries. I vote for competent bureau bureaucrats. I want to elect competent bureaucrats, not saviors, not liberators. Kwame Ture said only we can free us. And politicians ain't of the people. It's a different class of people. But they can impact things that matter to us. So Kim Fox was a prosecutor. I'm sorry, state's attorney. And Kim Fox policy was, and if Kim Fox has been in office for two terms, eight years, and as a result of her policy and approach, there are a lot of people who otherwise would have had felonies. If her opposition had won, there'd be a lot of black people who are out here walking around free who would be in jail. There'd be a lot of black people who had to do some time, had to pay some fines, but instead of paying some fine and doing a little time, they'd have felonies, right? So Kim Fox is a competent bureaucrat. She had a very uh, cohesive and comprehensive po policy platform. Hers was a non-punitive approach to the state's attorney's office. She, it used to be before she was elected, if you stole an item between $300 or more, you would be under felony conviction. And now she, um, she would, uh, she said she moved that to 1000. So a lot of people trying to steal to get by, trying to get them, get over and get them a little hustle and a grind on who otherwise would have been serving jail time with a felony on their record, might have to pay a fine, might get expelled from a place, but they're not getting felony convictions. And if you've ever been arrested and you've been sitting next to a lawyer trying to negotiate your charges and, 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 and reduce the charges and you know, them little codes they put next to your name. You know, when you're looking at jail time and you're praying for, for probation and public service or some shit, community service. I've been arrested. And I could have been gone to jail or I could go, you know, to the Salvation Army and, and Windex some windows for a few months to work out my community service and pay a fine. I know what that fucking feels like. So the, the level of charges that a prosecutor is willing to bring against you is very relevant. And I know some of y'all law abiding citizens. Y'all don't go to protest. Y'all don't bust windows. Y'all don't have to steal to eat or steal to look fly. To me, both of those are valid. Stealing to look fly and stealing to eat. As long as you steal. My dad, who's a, a more than a three times felon, he told me early on, you know, I'd run up in a bank and rob a bank before I snatched a purse. And he didn't talk it. He was like, I got sisters. I wouldn't snatch a purse off of a sister walking down the street before I ran up on a Brinks truck to take their money. So you can even have ethics as a criminal by their terms. To me, they're the criminals. But you can have ethics and, and principles and standards. You know, if you're going to get out here and grind and hustle, my position is don't compound someone else's oppression. Anyway, I'm going to vote for Clayton Harris the third. Another third. These black people, man, you meet a black person that's I'm the third. I'm always impressed by that. <laughs> Your family held it together under genocidal oppression for at least three, four generations. So Clayton Harris the third. He's another Democrat, two Democrats down. And the motherfucker, here's the thing. Let me not say that. He basically has promised. Now, I don't fucking know. He could be lying. And I'm going to watch that he's going to maintain Kim Fox's hands-off approach. The city of Chicago hates Kim Fox because Kim Fox was not enthusiastic enough about locking up black folks. If you go around this city, you see graffiti and, 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 and placards and flyers. They hate white folks, hate Kim Fox. And Kim Fox is like, I got elected by the people and I'm not just going to be locking up black folks wholesale. And I'm going to be less likely to bring. Uh, and then there's the safety act. And she was Q 
key into getting rid of cash bail. So if I commit a crime and a millionaire commits a crime because they got money in the exact same crime, they can walk out in a few hours and I could spend the next two years in Cook County Jail awaiting trial. So now they say, it's how is it just that you are some people are able to pay a bond and walk out and other people have to stay in jail because they can't pay. So they get rid of cash bond. So whether or not you stay in prison depends on or in jail awaiting trial depends on the nature of your crime, the nature of your crime and the the the, the strength of the case. So when a when a, a homeless man commits a crime and a billionaire commits a crime, they both technically have the same opportunity to walk out of there if it's the same crime cashless bail has pat and it people it is under the safety act and people and i know some of y'all oh, that ain't freedom because i'm an abolitionist i have no faith in the u.s justice system it has been enacted chicago is better off for it less punitive enforcement, more restorative justice. Kim Fox was a competent bureaucrat. She's not a revolutionary. She's not a freedom fighter. She wasn't going to liberate. Uh, she kept some people out of jail and a few people who were caught doing some crimes. They got less time they otherwise would have got and they got lesser charges they otherwise would have got because of Kim Fox and people are walking around with a right to, to, to get a student loan or a mortgage or go or apply to school or work in certain jobs because they don't have felonies where otherwise if her opponent was elected, they'd be felons. They'd be under the new Jim Crow. And so Clayton Harris has said, I don't intend to deviate from Kim Fox's policies and from her policies and what she's trying to do. And I'm going to be, and for violent, he's going to go after violent criminals. He's going to protect business. He's got all that rhetoric. But his opponent, and he's not funded by, by big money. I looked at his funding, and he don't have no big major funding. And he has a lot of endorsements from like the local unions and the local, a lot of local progressive organizations. Whereas his opponent, who's a basically this makes the same claim as him, but she got a lot of money from a lot of wealthy white men in this city. And anyway, not even gonna name her. I'm voting for Clayton Harris. And the reason I'm voting for Clayton Harris is because, um, like I said, he has made the campaign assertion. I went to his website again. Let me just go there and I look at, I don't pay no attention to the speeches or nothing that. The third. And that's why I was going to vote against him just because he's a third. I don't this black bourgeoisie. The Clayton Harris third. <laughs> but uh, this is what he look like. What it look, what it look. Um, that's him right there. So that's Clayton Harris and this brother, he, uh, there's his wife and his two children, you know, and, but he claims that he's going to be, okay, see, appealing to the white folks, smart. I ain't sending him a goddamn dime. But anyway, this dude I'm voting for, for uh state's attorney and his campaign priorities. I really support, right? Lawyers can't really have platforms or policies. They're not supposed to make policy. They're supposed to, so even though, um, but like I said, his main, the only, the main reason I'm supporting him is number one, there's no fucking shit in his record. Now, well, if he did some dirt, he's hit it pretty well, but he's never been in his legal career. One of them lock him up, throw away the key, the law, I am the law, but his opponent, I don't want to name her. So, and then they have a bunch of other judges. There are dozens of judges on the ballot. Now, when it comes to often, if you've ever voted before, if this is your first time voting, when it comes to judges, um, you're not voting to elect a judge or or the judges are appoint, appointed, and then you can vote to retain them or reject them. My policy is, if it is a judge who was a prosecutor, I reject all prosecutors. I don't think prosecutors should be judges. I only think defense attorneys and, and those who have fought on behalf of the people should be able to judge the people. So, and I know I'm not, in, this isn't an endorsement for, the, this is my own voting strategy and voting policy. So you can vote to, we're going to be voting for the uh, appellate court judge. 
uh, circuit court judges, a lot of them motherfuckers. And I have my list of those I'm going to vote against. And I have to take this in because there's there will be dozens of judges and the, the ballot's going to say, do you vote to retain or reject this judge? And so um, and I'm going to make a copy of this and give it to my wife. And then she's going to tell me her retain and reject. And so, and I'll tell you my policies, judges that have had a, um, any type of judicial issues with, because some judges, if you look at their record, they always like, oh, this judge had an overturn or a reprimand. A lot of times, believe it or not, some judges get a reprimand because they're not harsh enough because they, 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 they're they not locking up enough people and shit like that. So don't just say, well, this judge has a reprimand or this judge came up for a review. Sometimes judges come up like Judge Wright. Go read the book, Black Robes, White Justice. It's not just a very informative book. The guy is, he's a judge, but he's just like a very witty and entertaining. It reads like a novel almost. It's very entertaining reading, even though it's nonfiction. So check out Black Robes, His Antidotes. It's a wonderful book, and it'll give you a very deep understanding of critical race theory and understanding the the, the impact of race on, on, on the uh, judicial system and law enforcement and, and, and legal representation. But anyway, I'll give you the list of the judges I reject because they have a history of bias. They have a history of, of, of um, being prosecutors. They have a history of um, other incidents or negative reviews or hang them judges or throw away the key judges, right? So if they've had a past negative uh, controversy or if they have an overall negative rating from the people, the community they represent, especially in the black community, I'm voting not to retain them. So James, in the appellate court, there's only one judge that's really been a problem, and that's James Fitzgerald Smith. James Fitzgerald Smith. Voting against him because he's a former prosecutor. I'm voting against Timothy Evans because he's had a history of controversial positions and conservatism. Uh, Charles Patrick Burns, again, former prosecutor with, with uh, past con uh, controvert um, racist issues and accusations. I don't care. Guilty. John Patrick Kirby, because he's a former prosecutor, even though people like him. John Patrick Kirby, no. Jim Ryan, no. Thaddeus L. Wilson, no. William H. Brooks, no. Thomas V. Lyons, no. Sandra Ramos, no. Um, um, what is, I can, Alexandra, short, they call her Alex Giuseppe, or Alexandra Giuseppe, no. Uh, Eve Marie Riley, no. Um, Rosa uh, Fernandez, no. John, is John Fitzgerald? God, that's a popular judge name. You want your child to be a judge, call them so many fucking. John Fitzgerald, like, no. Uh, Carrie Hamilton, no. Renee, no. I'm gonna change that. So Daryl Jones, no. Um, Stephen Kozicki, K O Z I C K I, no, former prosecutor. Mary Kathleen McHugh, she said some off colored things, uh, no. Leonard Murray, no. Marguerite Ann Quinn, no. Some of these people have nothing else, uh, but, but there's. There's over two dozen judges on this list. So the vast majority I'm saying yes to go ahead and retain them. But those are the ones, absolutely the blood clot not. Simple. And the main thing, the main thing is vote yes on bring Chicago home policy. Bring Chicago home. The conservatives hate it. The rich folks hate it. The white folks hate it. The bring Chicago home. Vote yes. That's the main thing I wouldn't admit. That's the main thing I'm going to vote for. Bring Chicago home reduces the tax burden on property purchases or property exchange inheritance on property valued $1 million or less. 
it reduces taxes on those real estate transactions valued one million or less. But property transactions that valued at one million dollars or more, there will be an increased tax burden, and the revenues generated from that increased tax burden will go to housing homeless people in the city. It is what is called a leveling policy. And the founding fathers, the founding rapists, the founding genociders, the founding invaders understood the leveling impulses of the general public. And that's why they created like unelected bodies, like the, 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 the uh, senators, state senators. It, within this great American democracy, they always had checks and balances to in the electoral college because they said if you give people the opportunity to vote more for themselves and less for others, they will take it. And because the people who have next to nothing always make up the majority and the people who have a lot of shit always make up a minority, you have to protect the minority of the opulent. So the vast majority of policies that are enforced or come through the system are there to protect one minority, which is called the uh, minority of the opulent. And the checks and balances in the system are there to stop or subdue the leveling impulses of the masses. So every now and then, this is our second time they wanted to amend the Constitution to up in the, the, the flat tax rate, which lost. Because right now, if you live in Cook County, all over the news, they were like, there's a new tax, booga, booga, booga. And you got people like, I hate taxes. I hate taxes. There's no reason to hate taxes. There's no reason to hate taxes. You should hate the failure to tax the rich and the ongoing taxation of the poor. Don't be emotional about taxes. Tax the people who got all the shit. Tax the colonizer. Tax the elites. Tax the rich. Tax the billionaire. But the billionaires have convinced us to just hate taxes across the board. So when you see tax on the ballot, you say no. And you say, well, well, a flat tax. So what we should do is the same thing the elites do. The elites seek to put the tax burden on the masses. But the masses seek to eliminate any tax. So what happens is if you do not tax the elite at a higher level, then the working and poor people will pay a higher percentage of the tax if they even make enough to be even qualify to pay federal tax. So this is one of those leveling policies. You should vote yes on the bring Chicago home policy that will force wealthy people, seven income figure income individuals, wealthy elite, because if you go in Chicago, Chicago, a major U, like every other major U.S. city, has an enormous homeless population. It has blighted properties all over this city, vacant lots. And then you go to some areas on this in this city. Not only do they not look like they're the same fucking in the same city, in the same goddamn county, they look like a different planet. You go to these glass skyscrapers, these luxury homes. They, they just earmarked a billion dollars to transform former rail yard into a uh, opulent high end. This is from the, the, the previous mayor, um, Rahm Emanuel and his predecessor. They set this shit up. So you go there, people come here and go up and down the Gold Coast. They go to the Miracle Mile. They go to Daily Plaza and be like, wow, Chicago is an amazing city. So what this policy will do was go to those areas and the people who can afford to live there and say, you got to kick in for your fellow man. It puts the burden of the homeless people on the wealthy. How can you vote against that? So that's my main thing. I, if I can get my son to come out and vote tomorrow, he's registered, he's ready. So I'm going to call my son and, of course, my wife. And we're going to stroll to the polls. And that's how we will be voting. I wanted to talk about conservatism, liberalism, what a liberal really is and what liberalism really means. And why you hear black people all over social media and all over the community that, that claim to be conscious. They love to attack and talk about liberals. And, and, and I want to assess the 
statement that Malcolm X made about liberals and liberalism. And why I'm going to tell you, it no longer applies. We are not, we are not simply to regurgitate and mimic our great leaders and our great teachers. We must build on it. I've had some really great teachers in my life, directly and indirectly. There are teachers whom I've read and uh, studied from afar because they were dead or they were far away. And I have teachers that I was able to talk to directly. And let me tell you, as much as I love to quote some of my greatest teachers, some of my greatest role models, there's nothing that they have told me that I had. I don't scrutinize. I don't critique that I don't have to sometimes make adjustment to. And some of the things my greatest teachers taught me, I've had to discard or disregard either because it was wrong from the giddy up or more likely than not, it no longer suits the condition in the situation. So we're going to talk about that on Wednesday. If, if Skip is good, I, I message Skip. So that's how I will be voting. Oh, how could I miss that? For water reclamation, you have to choose three water reclamation district and we only have one green party candidate on the ballot uh i i'm really frustrated with the green party because i think they have the best platform but they they they're stupid the green party is very stupid they focus way too much on national elections and making sure they have a party and and they're they have like a ego issue they have ego trip instead of trying to run a presidential candidate every four years they would do better to build up local constituencies and local parties they should be looking to have green aldermen green uh um, city council members green water reclamation and 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 green local officials and use that as a foundation but they're trying to build from the top down which is not a green policy so green politics and green policies are contradict each other i can get in that later but toenail jackson toenail jackson black woman who's a green party candidate for water reclamation uh, vote Toneal Jackson before all. She's the one I'm most, the one I'm most not strategically be because I genuinely support her. Now I have, you know, I have worked, I've worked on city council uh, elections here and in Kansas City. I even did some volunteer work for a congressional election trying to take down uh, Major Owens. There was a upstart politician, community organizer who was trying to take down uh, Major Owens. But I've worked in candidate. Uh, I've worked in several political campaigns, um, but I've done everything from design flyers and knock on doors to write policy platforms and public statements for politicians. So, yeah, I, I, I do that. I think that's a crucial part. Of the, and again, don't let these stupid motherfuckers tell you that engaging U.S. politics means you the white man is the savior or you believe in America or you're a patriot. Every intelligent institution and system and society in this world seeks the, the Chinese seek to influence U.S. politics. The Russians seek to influence U.S. politics. The state of Israel seeks and has lobbyists in U.S. politics. Every major corporation uh, puts a large portion of his budget to campaign donations and lobbyists. I have some friends who worked as lobbyists in D.C., both federal lobbyists and also worked in various state houses as lobbyists. Everybody seeks to impact U.S. election every cycle. And it's not because they believe in America or they love America or they think America will solve all their problems or the government is good. It's because if you are really about power, you employ what Malcolm X said, all means available to you. If the vote was lost tomorrow, and let me tell you something else. Everybody's like, oh, and it's the, the community, the organizations. There should be a Biden uh, strategy and a Trump strategy, meaning regardless of which one of these, because gen they're both genocidal pieces of shit, and I don't think any self-respecting black person should vote for either of them. Didn't vote for Biden this term or the next, but they have different approaches. One is venomous, one is poisonous. But you cannot absolve yourself. If you say, I'm not voting at all, you're part of the fucking problem. If you vote for Trump, you're part of the fucking problem. If you vote for Biden, you're part of the fucking problem. But if you do 
have the capacity to vote in U.S. election, just like tomorrow. I'm going to go to the ballot, and there's a million and one things on that ballot that ain't Joe Biden or Donald Trump. There's options. Exercise them. Wow. We've got an idiot in the... Uh, well, let me not... Mm. So anyway. That's it. I'm going to open it up so you can come on here and ask me your stupid question, uh, Van Dam. But I was, it's a fake person, though. Let me see. I'm going to open this up for questions, comments, and criticisms. If you want the link, I'm going to just give you the link. Uh, link. The link is in the comments for you to come on live. Uh, but for thank you for the super stickers. But uh, Sully, Walker, the third. It's all these thirds, all these uh, pedigree. <laughs> Where am I finding all these pedigree? But Sully, we haven't been voting DNC for 60 years straight. The RNC doesn't owe us anything. The DNC is a different deal, sir. I disagree with that because guess what? Black people were voting Republican longer than we were voting Democrat. Black people voted Republican from reconstructions from the late 18, from the 1860s to the 1960s. Black people were the key constituents of the Republican Party because the Republican Party was the, the, the party of Lincoln. Martin Luther King's father was a staunch Republican. My great grandfather, bless his heart, Sonic's buoy was a registered Republican because the Republican was the party of Lincoln, the party of the abolitionists. And it wasn't until the Southern strategy where the parties flipped and the races ran over to left the Democratic Party and went to the Republicans and black folks intelligently and correctly migrated. So if, if, if you're going off of how long black people support it, we supported the republicans for almost a half a century longer than we gave support to the to the uh democrats if you're going off of that but i don't say you go off of that but if that's how you want to do it we put in more time so go look at the timeline number one number two politics is not about uh, it, it's not a intimate relationship. You do for me, you do every single cycle, every season. It is there. There are no such thing as permanent allies. The Democratic Party does not owe us allyship any more than we owe that. Every election cycle, this shit has a chance to flip and renew. So we need to, the only thing we need to be loyal to and expect loyalty from is our interest in each other as a people. As far as either party, if you walk around, they owe me with a chip on your shoulder. You ain't doing politics right. Get your feelings out of it. You know, get your feelings out of politics. Kofi, the black critique. You're live and direct on the Bro Diallo broadcast. Hey, how you doing? Um, long time listener, first time caller. I, um, thank you for taking my call. Happy to have you. Question yeah, I, or criticism. Yeah. Um, so I agree. I don't disagree with what you're saying. I, I, I really wonder how, what's your strategy as far as like, because I do believe you vote left of Joe Biden, right? So for people who would say, I want to get your thought on, for people who would say, well, okay, the Green Party, the Libertarian Party, and all these other parties, they're not really major parties. So if you're voting for them, isn't that kind of like throwing your vote away, leaving, uh, 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 you know, for, let's say, Trump or whoever to get in office? Do you see that as a throwaway vote? I know it's messaging, but don't you see it as a throwaway vote? Because I know. Absolutely not. OK, and I'll tell you why. This is not a horse race. You're not trying to pick a winner. Voting has never been about picking the winner. Right. Why do you vote? Well, I vote for whoever, I mean, it's like chess, whoever right. has the best policy, or sometimes you do have to vote for the lesser of two evils. I mean, I'd rather have someone that slapped fire out of me rather than someone's going to chop my leg. You know, it's the out, both outcomes aren't good, but one is, is less worse than the other. Well, th now you've asked me two different questions. Well, so my we're gonna talk about throwing votes away. We're going to talk about the lesser evil fallacy. Well, this is how so, so this is how I'm connecting the two connecting the dots. So from my perspective, from what's going on in the political arena right now, I don't like I do not like Biden. I do not like Trump. Right. 
But as let me ask you a question. Sure. Let me flip it on you. As an as a voter, would you vote, rather vote for what you don't want and get it, or vote for what you do want and not get it? From what I've seen for any of these candidates or whoever who I vote, I'm not going to get it. You didn't answer my question. You have well, two I'm options. Go, I'm sorry, go ahead. You have the option of voting for what you actually want and not getting it, or you have the option of voting for what you don't want and, act and getting it. Which is the better position? Well, the first option. Exactly. There's no such thing as throwing away your vote in a democracy. In a democracy, or in an election, you vote for who you want. You don't vote for who might win. If you want to pick winners, play the lottery. If you want to pick a winner, go to a horse race, which as an animal rights advocate, I say you shouldn't go to horse or dog races, but in this analogy. So we're not trying to vote for the winner, even though we want the person we vote for to win. And even if you vote, voter engagement, voter engagement is is crucial you are impacting policies and priorities and messaging when you vote whether your candidate wins or not so if you'll see like because of the uh success of bernie bernie lost but bernie has been more influential as an independent bernie was an independent senator he wasn't in either party but he was more uh, influential in moving their policy than the the elected president in many ways so even if you, if you can get enough people to vote green, what will happen is even if the Greens never take office, the Democrats and the Republican will adopt green rhetoric. And they might even have to go so far as initiate green policies. Well, that was my but, train of thought when doing that because I did want to go for but Bernie. But if you vote for the lesser evil, you give them no incentive. You give them no incentive to make an adjustment. I see what you're saying. Uh, it, it's kind of like a double-edged sword in, 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 in a way. Is like it's not a really a throwaway vote because what you're doing is like, hey, look, I'm not voting for this guy. I'm the only people very throwing for their left. vote are the people who do not go to the polls. The people say, I ain't voting. It don't make no difference. Those are the only people who throw away their votes. If you're voting, even if you're voting for a candidate that doesn't have a chance in hell in winning, like my candidate, the one I'm voting for, I am sending a staunch message. I'm not even a registered Democrat. But I'm going to spit in the face of the fucking Democratic establishment with my yeah. vote. And if this guy can get 8 to 12 percent of the, the vote, believe you me, the candidate you do want to vote. If if, if I'm a candidate and I get 8 percent in a national election, believe you me, I can walk in as a DNC person because the elections are never an individual. When you're voting for an individual, you're still voting for a party platform. You're also voting for a cabinet and appointees. And that's very yes. influential. So that's what All we right. have to understand. Don't ever vote for who is likely to win. Vote only for who you want to win, even if you're the only person that votes for them. Well, my next question would be... Oh, yeah, based, I, I got a couple so, of people in this. So yeah, yeah, okay. So I'm going to make it real quick. So so you don't feel in this day and age with... Do You don't feel with Donald Trump and his state of mind of wanting to be a dictator and throw away the Constitution and throw away democracy as a whole. You don't feel that is something that we need to be concerned about and where you may have to go to Joe Biden instead of voting very far left of Joe Biden? If I thought that Joe Biden would upend the U.S. descent into open fascism, I'd probably vote for him. But Joe Biden is not going to to stop or even delay that, that slide. Well, no, no, I said Trump. If Trump, when in his saying he's going to get rid of the Constitution, he I be don't a like Trump. I think Trump should be in prison. Trump is the scum Agreed. of the earth. Agreed. But I'm not going to vote for Biden because I don't like Trump or because I fear what Trump will do. Okay. I don't vote out of fear. All right. All right. Everything so you said about Trump, Trump is a fascist. Trump fascist, racist, or, 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 crook. Or, yeah, he's he's all that, and then some, and he's a rapist and a predator. Now, he's a, my he's been, he's been he's been lost a case where he was accused of being a sexual predator and a Gene Carroll. And he lost that case. So on paper, he lost a civil suit. So on paper, he's a sexual predator and there's nothing good you can say about him. I hate that man's guts. And I don't yeah. respect anybody that supports him or votes for him from Kanye West on down to the, our confused uncles in the MAGA hats. Fuck Trump and anybody that rocks with him. 
So I'm glad you said that. So I'm going to make a statement. So I just want to let you know, on my channel, I talk with a lot of black conservatives and I actually have a black conservative that when I told that Trump was um, found guilty for for sexual assault, they try to explain away. I, I asked this guy. Right? I'm not going to tell you who, who his name is. But I said, hey, look, Trump walked in on little girls during a beauty pageant. Yeah, do in the 90s. Trump's crimes are well known. Trump and 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 that yeah, Trump is a a confirmed and Trump but, was on there with, but, with, with who's that guy? Epstein. Uh, he was, Epstein. He was on, yeah. yeah, he was on Epstein list saying that he likes some young. Yeah. Right. So this guy, I asked him like, hey, look, not you to mention see? about how he's he's whacking off to his daughter. Yeah, he said he would like that. He, he was on the view about his daughter. Yeah, yeah he yeah, said. Well, Trump is, is, is a predatory scumbag racist. Yes, there's not enough negative things we can say about Trump. So they had asked the guy. So I asked the guy, I was like, hey, look, you want to demonize, say, the, the, the Democrats, they're pro-LGBT and, and lying. They're putting on pro-LGBT and trans bills and stuff like that. I was like, what are you talking about all the sexual misconduct? When Trump walked in on 15 girls, with like from like 12 to 15 year old girls. Judging wait, wait, wait. Yeah. Hold on. Let me. You were having a conversation with a black Trump supporter. Yes. And facts I said, what are you... relevant to, to, to cult members? They don't care about facts. Exactly. But this is how disgusting it is. This is a man right. with a family. And I said, but he went in there and he said he was trying to he looked on grown girls. This man's response to that was that, hey, they asked him to judge it. What you want? Right. That was their response. Well, These people well, are dangerous. Here's a good rule of thumb when it comes to conservative. This doesn't apply as much to liberals, but this definitely applies to conservatives. Every accusation is a confession. Whatever they're accusing other people of doing, when they exactly. were black people didn't have family values, when they were saying black people didn't respect the law, and then they ran up and smeared feces and urine all over the state house in their riots, when they were saying we were the ones who riot. So when they're accusing everybody of being a groomer and a pedo, they're every when it comes to a conservative, every accusation is a is a confession. It's pretty much yeah, a reflection on them. So yeah, so yeah, yeah I, I just want to see what that. Thank That's how the yeah. conservative mind works. But I appreciate you, brother. Please. Thank you, man. Thank you very much. All right, Thank please. You. All right, Nico, live and direct. You're on the Bro Diallo broadcast. Welcome. Oh, hey, what's up, man? Appreciate you. What's up? Oh uh, yeah, sorry. I'm just getting away from uh, washing dishes real quick. But um, yeah, I had a question. Can I ask him one more question about veganism real quick? Or go ahead. On elections, awesome. Um. So I appreciate your comments about eco-fascism and, uh, you know, it just made like when I thought about, you know, Zionism and it's like, ah, obviously. And then I reflected, uh, I've done a lot of like work with uh, the black vegan community here in the, in the DMV, Maryland area. And I met a lot of uh, Hebrew Israel Israelites mm -hmm. uh, within that own restaurants that run it, that work within the uh, thing. So I was wondering if you, uh, I heard you like talk about it a little bit. I wonder if you could get a little bit more context on like what that's about. Because I had a manager who's a black lady and she uh, took her sons to Israel. And so I waited about a year before I like dropped the question, you know, <laughs> how do you like reconcile going to Israel and all that? And then she hit me with the, oh, well, it was cool because they think we are the chosen people or something. I was like, uh, <laughs> OK, I mean, that doesn't, you know, obviously like negate the genocide and like all the fascist uh, shit. But, yeah, I was just curious, like, where does that come from? Because it's very you know, odd to me. And I mean, I, it's probably before my time, but I just remember you making a reference to it about something in the 80s, 90s, when they all went out to Israel. And she had two sons and they both uh, were raised, they were raised vegan and all that other stuff. Hmm. But yeah, I don't know. I was just curious if you had any more context. And then also just relating to that, it then kind of goes to how these uh, vegan, these black vegan restaurants, you know, they like, veganism is promoted to and marketed to black people as being healthy but a lot of the like soul food shit that we like put in these like vegan meals are like full of sugar cooked to like steep in canola oil fried very unhealthy but we're still just letting them you know letting people because i always i always direct the people to raw food and cold stuff because the hot stuff is good yes but not healthy and if you're asking me for a healthy meal i'm gonna you know but like that's just what we're supposed to do at least ethically so I was just curious, you know, um, how do we also combat like the uh, holistic, the holistic uh, propaganda that is targeting and harming our people uh, in the same way that, you know, just regular soul food uh, propaganda, I guess. And like how we still have to eat all these, how we can't 
evolved our palates past like when our ancestors were forced to eat. You know what I mean? Um, mm. So I don't know. I'm just curious about your uh, knowledge and insight on just the movement of these Hebrew Israelites to Israel, and then also, I guess, yeah. Well, the thing about Hebrews, um, since we've been brought under the Ma'afa, African culture has been under relentless attack. It's been demonized. It's been erased. It's been distorted. Mm -hmm. So you will find a lot of populations of African people who have what is called low racial esteem. Mm -hmm. And even those who have rhetoric like, oh, we built this country or we built the pyramids, they have a lot of strong rhetoric, but internally... Um, they they do not understand that um, our history as we, it's hard. It's like if you listen to many of the archaeologists and historians, they'll tell you upwards of 90 percent of the documented history of Africa has been lost mm -hmm. and they're still trying to secure it. Our artifacts, our scrolls are in the basement, not even on display in many of the universities the museums and the archival sites of invaders. Africa has been under relentless invasion from all sides, from, from um, Southern Europeans, the Greeks and the Romans, to the, to the Arabs, Muslim uh, invaders and colonizers, to, to the Western European and Northern European invaders, and now even places like India, and uh, China are getting in on the colonial hustle. So when you have people who have been subjected to not only the colonization of their lands, but the distortion of their identity, their history, African people tend to graft onto things that will restore their dignity. So stories and mythologies like being the chosen people, and the mythology about Moses bringing people out of bondage and a lot of African people and formerly enslaved Africans really uh, embraced that myth. It's a fucking lie. Moses never existed. There was never any bondage in, e uh, in Egypt. There was never 40 days in the wilderness. But because that story, it allowed many black people to recapture a false sense of pride based on a fallacy that, oh, we were the people, we were the ones who were put in bondage. So the teachings of the black Hebrew Israelite cult is that African people were God's chosen people. We were the true people in bondage. We are not Africans. The Africans are not us and we are not them. The reason we came into bondage in the United States is because we broke the covenant with Yahweh and Yahweh allowed us to return to bondage because we broke that covenant and the only way for us to stand return to our covenant our sacred covenant with Yahweh is to realize who we are and how great we are so the Hebrew myth is ab about the black Hebrew Israel now I'm not talking about the better Israel the Ethiopian Jews I'm talking about the black Hebrews you generally find in the African diaspora, the United States, parts of the Caribbean, uh, uh, now even like Puerto Rico and and uh, even some, but some parts of Latin America, it's spreading, is, is a myth that restores what African people, are. it's a shortcut. Because adopting a myth is so much easier than restoring our history, than comprehending reality. It's make-believe. So that's why, and then black people are like, well, if we're the real Jews, whatever comes to the uh, Askenazim or the Askenazi or the fake Jews, they believe they should guide. So they become tools and instruments and even allies in the atrocities in Palestine because they got this myth that was rooted in the damaged and destroyed egos and identities of African people. So the myth is that, that what's ironic is that the Talmudic racism that black skin is a curse and that black people were were we are not the chosen people. We were actually the, the descendants of Cain. And when Cain slayed his brother, he would be he would be cursed with a mark, which is dark skin. And he will be destined to serve the children of other nations as penance for our the original murder, the first murder. And so it's ironic that. 
the racists say black people were enslaved because God cursed us and God has reduced our status. Whereas the black Hebrews say Africans were enslaved because he loved us and we are of higher status. It's the same outcome, but for different reasons. And I've even had black Hebrew Israelites on my show that says, yes, black people brought slavery on ourselves. It's our fault for our breaking the covenant. So that's why it's, it, it, it is a story that restores people's egos. It gives them explanation and justification for something that has real no explanation. The horrendous of horrendous atrocities of the Ma'afa, the transatlantic slave trade and the and the lynching. It's 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 hard to comprehend. And a lot of times it's so traumatic that simple evidence and research and documentation is, is not enough to really give someone a grasp of it. So they were like, oh, this must be a divine curse, a divine will of an almighty being. Or as uh, it was called, the enemy of de uh, creating, turning the enemy into the deity. So the white man by enslaving, lynching, raping, genociding us was doing the will of God. It's fucked up. And it's nothing that any. So whenever any black people, that one ball chaser, what's his name? We were the true. Any black person saying we're the original Hebrews. We like, oh, oh, yeah, they're, they're just, it's not a black pride thing. Is it an affront? And also the key corner of that is say it makes the Europeans divine actors and it mm -hmm. makes the Africans our enemies, our African brothers and sisters. who are, Yeah, Kyrie Irving. Oh, shit. So people <laughs> got on me because I was so pissed off whenever some public figure, Nick Sperm Cannon or uh, Kyrie Irving, gets on there talking about, oh, yeah, we the original Jews. That is anti-Black and it's anti-African. And it gives divine justification for the most horrendous atrocities ever committed, man, uh, against our people. I don't even know if I answered your question. And as far as veganism, uh... Yes, um, there's a you can be a holistic vegan, but I say I'd rather be a canola eating vegan than a organic uh, flesh eater. But I understand a lot of veganism. Uh, when I first became a vegan, it wasn't for health; it was for animal rights. So I'd eat Oreo cookies and all kind of shit, and oh, it, was, yeah. it was more about it's not using living beings as commodities. That was more my motivation. The kind of health, understanding health, and all that other aspects of it came a little later yeah i mean yeah i appreciate that um yeah i just think that like i just see that like you know as long with just a lot of the food and like a lot of the uh, health uh implications that we have uh when it comes to yeah that, yeah that we're not doing like a lot of and i mean it's more so indicative of the black capitalist class and the black bourgeoisie who are very parasitic in nature so you know what i'm saying they just right. they they try to they try to uh or they just like sort of yeah, they don't they don't really try to like make anything better. They're just like, oh, this is what people like. And yeah, I don't know. I was just curious about your own experience with it, with those uh, groups. And also just on men's side, you know, she brought her kids to Israel. But then like they came back and soon he got like straight into like the whole rap culture, black culture. And like, you would never know that he spent 17 like whatever time's been 17 years in Israel because he was just, you know, he was like, I'm well, I mean, besides <laughs> like, the. <laughs> Besides the language, you'd yes. be surprised. Oh yeah, Israel is a state. It's it's the fifty first state. The United Israel is a proxy state of the United States. So you go there, it's the same fucking racism. It's the same white people acting superior. I had a young lady that was a waitress at my vegan restaurant, and she went there and she wanted her offspring to be born in the Holy Land. She was a Black Hebrew Israelite, and she was waiting in line, and this uh, Ashkenazim got in front of her. And she's like, ma'am, I was already in line. And the Jewish woman turned around and spit in her face. Israeli apartheid is not just applied to the Palestinians. The, the, the Ethiopian Jews or the, the Beta Israel, or, or it's, this is a slur, but it's, they're called the Falasha Jews. They, they face um, um, forced sterilization. Um, the, the black uh, uh, Jews who, who migrate to and participate in the atrocities of, of Israel against the Palestinians. They, they are abused in the military. They're given the most dangerous missions and, and, and least, least likely to be rewarded for their bravery and shit like that. Same shit. So it's not, it's not curious if black people think they're going to the Holy Land, the promised land to escape anything, you're just going to find another version of it. 
you know, you're just going to be called a Negro. There's a, a Yiddish word for nigga. That's all you, that's the only difference. They call you uh, uh, the N word in Yiddish instead of English. Other than that, what's the, and you get state sponsored healthcare that's paid for by the United States. But other than that, same thing. Anyway, I got to move on to the next one. I appreciate you, Nico. All right. Peace. Peace. Thank you for waiting. Oh, wrong one. Sorry. I'm going to put you back in the back room, Roman, because Richard uh, Sheffield, you've been waiting the longest. How you doing, Rich African Elder? I'm all right. Can you hear me, brother? Yes, loud and clear. Hey, man, before I get started, man, I just want to tell you I'm really proud of you, man. And the uh, reason I say that is because, uh, you know, you, uh, you know, you seem to be uh, pretty organic in your philosophy. You seem to believe what you say and, and, and uh, seem to move what you on what you say. Uh, I, I was the one who sent that super chat, uh, the free Di Diallo, man. And it, this one sister said free yeah. Diallo because you be catching it on BPM, man. Yeah, but yeah. Uh, they, anyway, this is my thing. You know, I, I've been watching uh, politics, man, since Johnson, you know, since I was a little boy uh, watching Johnson, watching the uh, Vietnam War go on, mm -hmm. you know, uh, Walter Cronkite, Dan Rather, casualties when it was on a, a chalkboard, you know, mm -hmm. how many died. And, you know, I've been hearing about policies and this and that and heard you talk about policies being affected and all that. But I had I had the uh, I had the uh, I guess I could say the, the the misfortune of being a drug addict. And one thing about being a drug addict, you know, um, a drug addict doesn't want to get the better of, of the lesser of two evils because he ain't getting high or she ain't getting high. You know, uh, I don't want to get sheetrock and a little coke and or just sheetrock. I want coke. You know, that's what I was about. And so, um, you know, it taught me that experience in being a drug addict really taught me a strong lesson on what is real and what is not and what the truth really is. Because, you know, I was on the near side of death. And I, I got to tell you, brother, you spoke about the Maafa and, you know, you're very right, man. You know, we are a broken people. Our, our dear beloved ancestor, Bobby E. Wright, said you cannot. He, he said you cannot. Uh, he said you cannot explain an, uh, an African phenomenon using mm -hmm. European methodologies. Mm -hmm. Right. And 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 so the Maafa is that constant, like you said, relentless charge against us and it's not it, we're not talking about uh uh the turn of, 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 of past centuries we're talking about the congo right now we're talking about the fact that black women of four times they die four times the rate of white women having babies these are the original women of the world these are the women who had babies in the in the fields and kept working these same women right who birthed all these generations now can't live you know that that's the serious thing you know and so when i hear negroes discuss trump and 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 his uh problems with women i'm like so i mean so what i mean like black men are number one in every unnatural death metric we have like that's what's really important flint still ain't got no water neither does jackson mississippi uh, mississippi you know but you know like we're not we're not looking at that so my question to you is and i kind of mentioned this at bpm too you know um it's we 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 already know the problem. We've been programmed to analyze the problem and scratch and itch and all kind of things about the problem, but we have not been allowed to think in in terms of solutions. And so, um, how do we how do we fight this fight? You know, because we have to fight. How do we fight, heal, and educate our people? in a way that's going to bring meaningful change you know i mean you know we can't just keep rolling re-rolling that script so how do we heal fight and educate our people all right i'm gonna I'm answer you off the air i'm not off the air but i'll answer you and, and then go to the next so yeah got gotcha, you bro i can answer it now number one we have to fight um in terms of fighting we have to employ asymmetric warfare Depending and, and again, it's hard to answer these questions because this is a pan-African global. So if we were in Nigeria, if we were in um, the DRC, if we were in Jamaica or Haiti, the fight is different. So I'll just speak from the 
context of, of the African diaspora here in the United States. Yes. We have to employ asymmetrical tactics or what is better known as guerrilla warfare tactics. And yeah. guerrilla warfare can be applied in the economic arena, the political arena. Of course, we understand it's well researched into the, the combat arena. We have to develop strategies and tactics that subvert their agendas, that subvert their institutions and, and, and cripple or subvert their infrastructure. And it's asymmetrical. We cannot, do, and as far as these black people out here toting guns and going to the gun range, that's purely cosmetic. That's cosplay. We do not have the numbers nor the the equipment to for a head-on confrontation, especially an armed one. But we are well positioned throughout this country to cause great levels, great levels of disruption or reversal of the interest and agendas. But you know we need education to do that. And that's the next thing. The problem with education is that it is not radical. We have a lot of black people that are skilled, that have uh, um, degrees, that have technical know-how. But the problem is ideology. Our education is not rooted in revolutionary pan-African ideology. No. We have everything else we need intellectually. You name a field and you can find black people prospering, dominating, advancing, innovating in that field. But the problem is they don't have the my former neighbor was a scientist, a very competent and skilled scientist. You know, but again, when I would have conversations with him, his ideology. And we out here rooting for black people because they we just had a young black man that went off to Harvard and, and he got accepted to five different Ivy League schools and he's top of his class and everybody's celebrating this dude. And they don't know what the fuck his ideology is. So I think our right. problem is since the counterintelligence program, which countered our intellect, yes, sir. we've lost Ooh. value for ideology and ideological work. You can do ph philosophical, academic, ideological work and the community will swear up and down, you ain't doing nothing. Yeah, they'd rather yeah. have you out there we we put our scholars and our thinkers and philosophers out there on out there to dig t trenches so anyway um the problem with education is that we don't lack know-how we don't lack skills it's that we don't know how to apply them to pan-african revolutionary struggle because we don't have ideology and we got people out here who are reactionary conservatives claiming they are the prince of pan-africanism Hey, so you're would not, you say, would you say leaders out here acting like they they are fighting to bring down the system when their core ideology talks about salvation from God or Allah? Hey, so would you say and because I believe I believe the foundation to an effective ideology is a full effective identity. What do you say about that? Uh, I think ideology and identity are, are interrelated. I think that ideology should be rooted and tied to identity, but I think that it's it's more holistic than that. And how uh, can you be more holistic than identity? I mean, how how can it, because, I mean how, how do you overlap that? Because even your identity is up for scrutiny. You got black people whose identity they believe they are the chosen people of Yahweh. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so yeah, but see, like, but that's the point. That's the point. Like, we have ineffectual identities. We have identities that don't serve us because think, we we we're everybody but who we are. I think it's more important that the ideology be rooted in the mission and the and the and the uh uh and and what you're trying to achieve as opposed to where you are. I think ideology right. for an oppressed people should be more oriented to where you're trying to go. Absolutely. I agree. Hey, man, listen, man, you, you know, you keep doing what you're doing. But again, like I said, man, I'm I'm really proud of you, man, your family, your, you know, you and your wife, man. I love the fact that you take pictures with her and uh, I'm proud of you doing things with your children. And uh, hey, man, I, I look, we, 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 we cheering for you out here, bro. I appreciate y'all. All right, man. All right. Next time, bro. OK, I think this will be our last. Uh chime in roman is back on the set 
What's up, the crowd Hope favorite? Everybody been waiting for you? <laughs> I know, I'm the star of the show. It should be <laughs> called the Bro Roman Show. Honestly. The Bro Roman Show. Yeah, that's all. I just been killing time till you got here. What's up, bro? <laughs> Thanks for holding the seat. Uh, <laughs> I just wanted to ask you about Afrocentricity, what it is how we can apply it to our core thinking, kind of similar, not really similar, but I feel like this kind of leads into what the other two brothers were talking about. You know, how, you know, we clearly black people are lacking an ideology. At least, you know, at this current moment, we're pretty hard up for finding a concrete way to think about ourselves and our situation. And I've been getting into reading about ancient Egypt and, you know, how scholars like Chancel Williams and check onto Dia. They've been called Afrocentrist, and in the Western world, that's seen as an insult, you know. And I'm curious as to how, if you could explain, you know, what what is Afrocentricity, and could you know rearrange re uh, rearranging our thinking to be Afrocentric? Could that be a benefit, and how could it be applied? Okay, the first book that I wrote read on African centeredness, which is kind of funny because we had a pretty contentious debate. But I read this book in like 1989 called The Afrocentric Idea. Maybe not even 1989, maybe I think in 88. I remember I had just got that new Boogie Down production uh, album and I would be listening to that and reading because when I was younger, I could listen to loud ass music and read and comprehend. Now I need to turn everything off to, to read a book. But when I was younger, I would be bumping, you know, uh, criminal minded. You've been blinded. And I'd be reading the Afrocentric idea, which is a book is more of a pamphlet by Molefi Ashanti. So it, it was really a, a great privilege for me to actually be able to speak with him and interview him. And like I said, we got into a pretty heated debate and he kind of took some jabs at me. He thinks I mispronounced my name. <laughs> One thing. But anyway, uh, Afric Afrocentricity has pretty much, the term has fallen out of favor. Uh, it, it became African-centered. They stopped using Afrocentricity around the mid to late 90s. It went from Afrocentric to African-centered. But Afrocentricity is basically Black people. It's what it is. It's African-centered. It's centering Africa and all of our um, ambitious goals organizing. That we understand that we come out of Africa and what we do, our, our positive works and our contributions should feed back into Africa. So basically, Afrocentricity realizes the direct descendants of Africa from those who live on and born in the continent to those who were forced, re, forcibly removed from the continent to the descendants of the forced removal, the African diaspora, that we should orient and prioritize what is in the best interest of the African continent and African people against all else and people who act against the interest of Africa and Africans are our enemies it's pretty straightforward and straight cut and say that there are african people out here acting in the best interest of america and americans africans out here who are lgbtq and acting in the best interest of that and there are africans out here who are capitalists and there are africans out here so the africans who are african centered understand that you can have diverse i uh positions you can be vegan lgbtq you can be uh uh have various religious uh, holdings, but your core is Africa, and from Africa you emerge, and to Africa you re return. But it's it's a little more than that technically, because there is a whole set of policies, there are a whole set of values and principles related to that. But you do what Africa make sure Africa gets what it needs before anything and anyone else you get. Okay, you know, that makes sense. So I don't. Know. But like I That's said, uh, that was I didn't even I I the African the Afrocentric idea this first time I really grasped myself. We would say Afro-American and African-American, but I always thought, you know, I'm an American and I'm black. But the fact that I am an African and I am as much African as you know, uh, a brother born on the continent or a sister born on the continent. That's something I really started to understand on a, on a uh, not just a genetic or biological level, but a timeline. So when they took Africa's 
out of the continent of Africa and brought them all over the world for nefarious purposes. They did not break us apart from Africa. They simply expanded Africa across the world. So we are an expansion of Africa, not a not a detachment from Africa. Okay, that's a good way to look at it. Or or as a as a speech from Arrested Development said, Africa's inside me. So you know, I bring Africa with me. You know, I don't have to go to Africa. I bring Africa. Or Che Guevara said, you know, the gorilla carries his nation in the soil be between his toes. Mm. You know, I hear that. Well, thank you, Dion. That's all I really wanted to ask. And you thank you, know. Roman. Until of next week. Of course. Until until next time. All right, bro. All right. That's the Bro Diallo broadcast. Like, share, subscribe. Thank you for all my contributors, people who have contributed. And if the Lord put it on your heart to to kick me down, oh, I got Coco. I got one more caller, and this is it. Uh, Colo. I said Coco. My eyes ain't what they used to be. Colo, welcome to the Bro Diallo broadcast. Questions, comment, criticism. We got to keep it short this time, though. Uh, Bro Diallo, I just want to say great show. Thank you. Um, always tune in to listen to you. Uh, didn't think I'd uh, you'd even put me on. So uh, I have no questions, comments, All right. or criticism. Just wanted to say keep doing what you're doing. I appreciate it. And I'm gonna do that. Only because you told me, Colo, because I was about to shut this whole shit down. But I'm going to keep it up because Colo said I need to. All right, bro. Thank you. And thank you for your support. Of course. Of course. All right. Peace. All right. So we get out of here. Uh, we'll be here Wednesday with, with Skip Coon, Rational Radicals. And, of course, I'm going to have to curse out uh, Jared for, for, for speaking on my name. So that'll be Friday. So tune in Friday for the curse out. Tune in um Wednesday, we're going to be talking about liberalism, conservatism, and 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 where black folks stand. All right, so that's that. Thank y'all for tuning in. Thank y'all for the contributions. And I'm going to uh, get up with y'all next Monday with the Bro Diallo podcast.